I'm the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, transcribed, it's the whistler's strange story, The First Year. The story of Lydia Winters falls naturally into two parts, separated by exactly one year, almost to the minute. Her marriage to Elliot Larkin ended, of course, on New Year's Eve, somewhere around midnight at a place called Silver Lake Lodge. The circumstances surrounding its ending are a matter of record now in the files of the police department, Homicide Division. The beginning is another story, a personal one. Just a year before, early on New Year's morning, as she entered her uncle's apartment after listening to the whistles ushering in the new year and bidding Elliot good night. Well, Uncle Phyllis. Oh, it's you. <laughs> you old darling, waiting up for me. There's a very good reason, lady. I want to talk to you. And seriously, for once. Oh? And I know just what it's about. You don't approve of Elliot Larkin, do you, dear? You think he's irresponsible, unworthy of me. And I'm so hard and thoughtless and gullible. You through? Mm-hmm. Good. And please understand this. If I have any concern about Elliot Larkin, it's on his account and not yours. That so? Exactly. The proper hands, he might grow up into a decent human being. You know, you're just like your mother was, Lydia. You are not in love with this man. He's not in love with you. You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Of course I'm sure. Well, to get to the point, Lydia, I will not approve your marriage to Elliot Larkin or any other man until you're able to look upon it as a sacred contract instead of uh, an adventure. I see. Well, for your information, I've agreed to marry Elliot tomorrow in Greenville, whether you approve or not. And there's nothing you can do about it. Oh? Good Lord, Phil. You can't do a thing like this now. Why not? You're a lawyer. You can draw it up. But, but it's vicious. You can't play with people's lives as if they were puppets. It's my money, Ballinger. I can do with it what I please. I'll get this again. The new will is to provide that if Lydia and Elliot Larkin live together as man and wife under the same roof for a period of ten years, they are to receive the principal legacy of $500,000 jointly, or half each, as they may choose. Then failing, it goes to the Children's Relief Fund. You got that? Yes, that's clear enough. Now, if at any time, during those ten years, either one of them die by any means. The entire sum is payable to the survivor immediately. Look, Philip, this thing is fiendish. It, it, it will set them at each other's throats. Well, if I'm right, if the marriage means nothing to either of them, it'll destroy them. On the other hand, if I'm wrong... It'll be a real reward. But, but don't you see? It's not a will, Philip. It's a weapon. Maybe. <laughs> I know I won't live to see it work out. But you'll see it, Ballinger. You'll see it. You are to acquaint them with the provisions just the moment that I die. There's a comfortable retainer in there for you to see that it's followed to the letter. You know, uh, I envy you, Ballinger. It should prove very interesting. In just a minute, the Whistler will continue tonight's story. All of us are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Boston, Massachusetts. No city in the United States is richer in historical associations than Boston, the 10th largest city of our country. 
The Declaration of Independence was proclaimed from the balcony of the old state house. Paul Revere saw the lantern shine from the old North Church before his famous ride that opened the Revolutionary War. The great New England poets had their homes here. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Julia Ward Howe, John Greenleaf Whittier, and writers like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Edgar Allan Poe. Today, Boston is the largest market of the shoe and leather industries in the world. It's also the largest wool market and the greatest fishing port in the United States. And they have the Boston Red Sox. It's the home of the Mother Church of Christian Science. And people all over the world know about Boston products. They buy $3 billion worth of them every year. It's no wonder that the people who call Boston their hometown are proud of their two nicknames. They call Boston the hub of the universe and the cradle of liberty. Thus has Boston taken its place in the building of America. And now, back to The Whistler. Yes, Lydia. You've escaped Uncle Philip's tyranny now. And it's worked out fairly well, hasn't it? It's not a storybook marriage, of course, but you didn't expect that. Still, Elliot is fairly presentable, reasonable, and charming, and wealthy enough to keep you well-dressed and entertained. And until something better comes along, you're content. It was an evening in October that changed all that. The two of you had just arrived home from a football game. Johnny Gates. I haven't seen him since college. <laughs> and you know, it was really a lucky break running in him that way. What do you mean, a lucky break? You didn't pay any attention to me or the game. No, I mean, he's leaving his job. He's going to the Orient. Oh? Yeah. Represent some liquor outfit, cordials, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, that's the job he's leaving. And it's a pretty good job. Well, what's that got to do with you? Well, he says he'll recommend me to replace him if I want it. You mean you... You're going to work? Well, why not? Can't be a playboy all my life. Elliot! Oh, Elliot! What? what in the world got into your head? What's so funny about that? I like... can't help it, Elliot. You weren't Oh, here. go get the phone, will you? Excuse me. <laughs> uh, hello? Mrs. Larkin? Yes? This is Mr. Ballinger, your uncle's lawyer. I'm not at home to my uncle, Mr. Ballinger. You can tell him... Just a minute, Mrs. Larkin. I'm calling to tell you your uncle passed away this afternoon. I see. It's my duty as his executor to read you the terms of his will. Uh, who is it? Uh, just a minute, please. Uncle Philip's dead. Something about the will. Oh, here, let me talk to him. I'll handle it. Huh? Uh, Mr. Ballinger... Perhaps you don't quite understand my relationship with Uncle Philip. Hey, wait a minute. Elliot. Cover the phone. Yeah. Hey, listen to me. What are you doing? I might knock some sense into your head, Angel. You may as well know it now. We're broke. Hello. That's why I took Johnny up on that job. Hello, Mrs. Larkin. You, you had money, a lot of it. Never you... mind that now. Now, you better tell that Mr. Ballinger will be glad to talk to him. Go on, go on, tell him. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Ballinger. Yes? Uh... You can come over right away. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how'd that taste, dear? What? The humble pie. I'm not exactly in the mood for that sort of thing, Elliot. Why didn't you tell me? You never asked. You just went along with what everybody believed about the Larkin fortune. You think that was fair to me? Well, it works two ways, Angel. After all, I was under the impression your Uncle Philip's worldly goods were practically in your pocket. Well, that's all there is to it, Lydia. I haven't left out anything. If there are any questions... No, no, it's, it's all very clear. Yes. Well, good night. Good night, Lot. Yeah. <laughs> Amusement, Elliot, or the beginning of hysteria. Oh, ten years. Nine to go. <laughs> and a 
in the light of our discussion earlier, You can I start w- forgetting that discussion right now. Huh? He's not going to beat me, Elliot. I want that money. I'm going to get it. Under the circumstances, The circumstances you... are unimportant. Appearances count most now. You mean we put on an act for balance? Exactly. You live your life, I live mine. No questions or answers. Uh, except to the watchdog. We can handle Ballinger. Huh. Well, I suppose it's worth a try. <laughs> All right, dear. What's the first move? Your friend, Johnny Gates. Johnny? You'll need that job now. You have a wife and a home to support. <laughs> At that moment, you're forced to admit something to yourself, aren't you, Lydia? That Uncle Philip was right. That your marriage to Elliot Larkin is a farce. A hollow, mocking thing that was never meant to be. Uncle Philip might as well be alive and laughing at you. Telling you that you can't win. But through it all, you determine that somehow, some way, you'll defeat Philip on his own ground. Then, on New Year's Eve, the night marking your first year together... Elliot called you at the apartment. Yes? Just thought you might be interested, Lydia. I got the job. Johnny's leaving right away. How nice. Tonight I can drink champagne that's paid for. Oh, yeah, and about that. I won't be able to make dinner until later. I'm helping Johnny celebrate. Don't worry about it. I meant to tell you we can skip the dinner plans. Hmm? I'm meeting Marty Bell at the Zebra Club. The Zebra Club? Oh, don't tell me you object. Don't. Well, I certainly do, Lydia. I don't mind what you're doing, you know that, but you've got to stay away from public places. I'll see you tomorrow, Elliot. Oh, no, you'll see me tonight if you insist on going there with Bell. I'll come down to the Zebra Club and i And I'll... what? Don't play the jealous husband, Elliot. That's really overdoing it. <laughs> Lydia. I love you. I want you to leave Elliot. Oh, stop it, Mark. You don't care a hang for Elliot. He doesn't deserve... I said stop it. Uh, there's someone coming over our table. Uh, an old friend. Really? Well, I don't see anyone. Oh, Mr. Ballinger. What an unexpected surprise. Yes, I dare say. Uh, I'd like you to meet Marty Bell, an old friend of Elliot. Oh? Marty, Mr. Ballinger. How do you do, Mr. Bell? Uh, Marty's keeping me company while I wait for Elliot, but he has an appointment. Maybe you'd sit in for a while, Mr. Ballinger. Oh, you've been a dear, Marty. I'll tell Elliot. Run along now. Nice to have met you, Bell. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Goodbye, Lydia. Bye, Marty. Thanks so much. He's such a dear. Uh-huh. Lydia, I've been intending to bring this up for some time. I uh, Well, you know, when there's any sign of trouble between you, you're on dangerous ground. Why, Mr. Ballinger, I don't know what you're talking about. We're getting along beautifully. Where is Elliot, Lydia? It's New Year's Eve. You two should be together. Well, of course we should, but the night is only beginning, Mr. Ballinger. Oh, wait, there's Elliot now. Well, here's my stray lamb. Darling, you remember Mr. Ballinger. Hello, Larkin. Oh, oh, yeah, sure. How are you, Mr. Ballinger? Sit down, my boy. I've already taken the liberty of ordering a round of drinks. Oh, how oh, nice. Well, if you'll permit me, I'd like to offer a toast on your anniversary. Uh, one year, isn't it? That's right. One beautiful year. Yes. Oh, we can drink to that. And, of course, to your future. May you remain as happy as you are tonight. Mr. Ballinger doesn't think it odd us leaving so early. I explained it to him. I've got to drive a friend to the airport. Oh, Johnny Gay? Yeah, yeah. Going up to Seattle on the midnight plane. What I didn't tell Ballinger is that uh, I'm going too. What? Yeah, I got my ticket, suitcase in the back. Elliot, you can't do this. Why not? Well, because of what it might mean. Ballinger is suspicious now. What would he think when he hears you've gone flying off somewhere on our anniversary? Well, he'll think maybe I've had all I can stand. For half a million dollars. Don't be a fool, Elliot. 
Look, I'll do anything you say. I'll stay away from Marty. Anything, Elliot. Just give me a chance. Oh. Now, look. Johnny's expecting me, Lydia, and I don't see how I can change anything now. I'm supposed to be there. There must be a way, Elliot. You'll regret this yourself. I know you will. I wonder... What? What are you thinking? Maybe Johnny can help us. You come on up with me. We'll talk to him. Well, maybe I'm a little slow, Elliot. Uh, give me another rundown on that, huh? Oh, it's simple, Johnny. I would like an extra day down here, that's all. Uh, you're flying north anyway, so couldn't you send that wire to the company for me? From the Seattle Hotel to cover you with the company. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That way Lydia and I can be together on an anniversary. I'll be up there in a day or two. Well, I don't suppose there'd be much doing over the holiday anyway. Oh, no, not a thing. But, of course, I don't want to beg off on my first assignment. Oh, I wouldn't be so good. Uh. Okay, pal, I'll handle it for you. Oh, swell. Johnny, I appreciate this, too. Oh, forget it. You've done plenty for me. Hey, one more thing. Uh... <laughs> I don't like the idea of turning in my plane ticket. I mean, you know, just in case the company should check. Oh, I don't think they will. Yeah, but I'd rather not take the chance. Well, look, Johnny, it, it, it won't matter to you. Couldn't you turn your ticket back in and go in my place all the way through? Well, if you'd feel safer. Oh, I really it. would, Johnny. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'll check into your hotel for you. The worst. Oh, fine. Hey, we better get going. Yeah, right away. I'll finish packing. Yeah. Well, satisfied, Lydia? Perfectly. As long as we're trying to make it look good to Ballinger, maybe we ought to go whole hog. How do you mean? Well, I mean, after we drop Johnny off at the airport, how about driving up to Silver Lake Lodge? Wonderful. Yeah. Remember the first time we were there? A brand new year. Brand new life. I remember it perfectly, Elliot. I'd love to go. I think it's exactly what Mr. Ballinger would like. Well, Lydia, for the moment you've won. But the worry of the future is on your mind driving down to the airport and watching Johnny Gates off on Flight 27. And all the way up to Silver Lake Lodge, you wonder about those nine long years ahead. It isn't going to be easy, Lydia. But somehow you're determined to make Elliot continue to see it your way. A few miles below the lodge, you ask him to stop at a roadside store. Just want to get some cigarettes, Elliot. I'll be right back. Take your time. Cigarette, please. Take a pick. Uh, it'll do. Here you are. A special flash. Then back to the New Year's round the town celebration. Flight 27 of Fearless Airlines, northbound for Portland, crashed and burned in an unexplained accident one hour ago. All on board were killed. <laughs> It comes that suddenly, doesn't it, Lydia? The answer to everything. Elliot, the money, everything. Yes, Lydia. Elliot was on that plane, even if it was in name only. At this very moment, as he waits for you in the car outside, he is officially dead. Certainly unidentifiable. And the words of Uncle Philip's will keep running through your mind. If at any time either Lydia or Elliot Larkin die... The entire sum is payable immediately to the survivor. Why did you do it? That's all right. Uh, just as I went into the store, there was some sort of news flash on the radio. Did, uh, did you hear it? What, a news flash? No. no. Almost from some other station. Yeah. So. Hey, I was enjoying that. Please, I'd like it quiet. We'll be up at the cabin in a few minutes. And right now, 
I want to think. Of course you want to think, Lydia. Of the loaded target pistol in the gun case at the cabin. Of how lonely it is here. Of how easy it will be to dispose of Elliot's body in this wilderness. Your eyes are on the gun case now. Just over Elliot's shoulder as the two of you sit in the living room of the cabin before the fire that he's built for the occasion. Ah. Well, Lydia, our first year. <laughs> Nine more to go. You know, Elliot, sometimes I wonder. Don't be half right. Use Yusufi. For example, how many main crowd formations would you say there are? Two? No, that's only half right. Brush up on your aeronautical meteorology. Tell your I and E officer you want to study with the United States Armed Forces Institute, USAFI. It's easy. It's simple. If you don't want to be half right, use USAFI. And now, back to The Whistler. Yes, the marriage of Lydia Winters Larkin ended on a New Year's Eve at a place called Silver Lake Lodge where she'd spent her honeymoon just a year before. There's a complete record now in the files of the Homicide Division. A record, too, of the persistence and determination of one of their detectives. Of his curiosity over the crash of a northbound airplane and the supposed death of a passenger named Elliot Larkin. Of a trail which finally ended with a confession of murder under a cold white light at police headquarters. Go on, Mr. Larkin. Oh, well, may as well know it all, I guess. I thought my alibi was perfect. I figured Johnny Gates would put me in Seattle at the time of the crime. You figured that out when Ballinger read you the will. Well, that's why I took the job. Why ain't you let assignment in Seattle the night Johnny was leaving? I did need the money. I wanted the half million. Never would have taken the chance if I hadn't thought it was airtight. And your alibi blew up in that plane. Yeah. You know, that's funny. That night in the car on the way up to Silver Lake? Yeah. And she asked me about some news flash. I think that was about the plane. Now, I wonder why she didn't tell me. Now, a question. Do you know when PT boats were first used by the Navy? Around 1810, Robert Fulton of Steamboat fame built what is considered to be the grandfather of our modern PT boat. His torpedo boat was 27 feet long and had six oars. The boat was provided with four blunderbusses on swivels, each one tended by a Marine armed with pistols and cutlasses. The oarsmen were also armed. The torpedo was placed at the bow and attached to a harpoon gun. When the boat approached the target ship, the gun was discharged and the torpedo released, a far cry from the PT boats of today. This is but one of many interesting facts which can be found in the history of your United States Navy. Featured in tonight's transcribed story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Dora Singleton, Victor Rodman, Lawrence Dobkin, Marvin Miller, and Byron Kane. The Whistler, directed by Sterling Tracy, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight's Whistler was written by Joel Malone and Harold Quant. This is George Wall speaking and reminding you to listen again next week for another strange tale by The Whistler. <laughs>